Hi, this is Ian Dempsey, and I'm delighted to introduce a very special interview by a very special guy, my friend, Tony Fenton. In January of this year, on learning of Tony's ill health, Bono invited Tony to his home in Dublin to interview him. Tony had been keen to interview Bono for many years. So, when they happened to bump into each other on a night out, as you do, Tony asked him to come into studio ahead of the release of U2's next album, which turned out to be the much-talked-about Songs of Innocence. They shook hands, and Bono promised he'd do the interview. Unfortunately, Tony was in hospital around the album's release in September of last year. But, fair play to him, Bono kept his promise and was delighted to welcome Tony into his home just after Christmas to record the following interview. Originally, we thought we'd call the interview When Tony Met Bono, but we changed our minds. So, this is When Bono Met Tony. Bono, thanks so much for inviting me into your beautiful home. Do you do many interviews from your house? Because I'm feeling a little special here today. I'm not leaving the house much um, these days. And and when I heard uh, the idea of doing interviews, I wasn't, uh, I'm not doing any interviews because I can't really concentrate on it. I have to concentrate on on getting fit for the tour. And I'm on painkillers, so you don't know what the hell I'm going to be saying. Um, but I figured if it was you, you'd probably be on painkillers too. <laughs> <laughs> I said, They're great, aren't they? <laughs> we, could be, we could have a bit of a laugh with this one. See if Tony comes out of the house and, uh, and, and let's, let's, let's have some fun with him. Yeah. Well, look, the, the new tour is kicking off pretty soon, actually. Uh, you two tours are well known for their massive production, huge audiences and re- world record beating sales. Are you looking forward to jumping back into the, the madness and the chaos again? Mad? Chaos? <laughs> oh, that would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, you know, I, I mean, look, if you find yourself in, 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 in a repetitious circumstance, you probably like it. And... You know, we always end up. Uh, our lives are are quite chaotic, and and you two recordings quite chaotic, and getting ready for tours quite chaotic. So we must like it. Uh, these big sets um, and these kind of big, so to speak, spectacles. Um, they're really not the point. What the point is is to make sure that every seat in the house can be the best one. That was, and that goes back to being in a sort of post-punk band in the late 70s, where it was very, it was a sellout to leave playing for the clubs. Like, we're not playing, you know, we will always play the clubs. You know, we're not in all these other places. I mean, that was like, was all that attitude going around the King's Road and... You know, punk bands would never, like, theatres were even, you know, frowned upon. And then the idea of playing these, you know, hockey arenas, you know, like Madison Square Gardens. Oh, I mean, that was a total sellout. And part of the reason that it was seen as a total sellout was that how could you experience that feeling that you get in a club? And I think I realised very early on that it wasn't about physical proximity it wasn't about your closeness and that in fact i could be up in the front row going to see some band and i might as well have been a mile away because it was the attitude of the band Mm. so it wasn't about physical proximity if they thought they were cooler than you if they thought they were on a different level than you that was the separation and so we just went about trying to preserve the connection with our audience first of all i used to climb into the audience used to climb over the speakers, used to get into all kinds of trouble from the band for doing it, trying to create a spectacle. You know that Dublin thing? Maybe you heard it when you were growing up. You're making a show out of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what I used to do. That's what I still do for a living. And, um, and so with you two, we, we, we're always conscious of not leaving that, our audience behind, of staying on the same level with them. And so when we got these ear monitors 
so suddenly the sound on on the stage was much better. Well, that meant that now you could walk out in front of the PA and not be out of time. There'd be no there'd be no echo. So then we put a stage out, a satellite stage. We were the first to do that. And this was ways of getting to the back of the hall. And then when we did the big videos, and you know, we were the first to have the billboard-sized video behind us on Pop Mart. Um, that was again a way of connecting so that somebody in the back of a stadium in you know, wherever, um, would feel close. And people say, oh, you play stadiums, why don't you play festivals? Well, I love festivals, but if you're standing at the back of a festival, it's mm. hard to see anything. Yeah, I remember uh, in the in the mid-'80s going to um, uh, the RDS to see Simple Minds and uh, a band who were really rocking in the 1980s. And, mm. uh, and I was so far back, my seat was just so far back, I couldn't, couldn't see Jim Kerr. I could barely hear the sound. And Clangorous his place as well. Yeah, and I, after about a half an hour, I got a tap on the shoulder and it was Larry Mullen. <laughs> and he says, what do you think? And I said, I'm too far away. You know, I mean, I pity the people here who paid huge dollars for, the, for their seats here. I can, I can barely hear the music. I can't see the guy. You know, why didn't they build a, a stage out from that stage up halfway and really connect with the audience. I, so that was you. <laughs> and so he, when Larry Mullen came to me and, and said, said no. ah. <laughs> and he said, that was that, you're the that, dude. He said, that's what they should be doing, you know. And uh, But it was the obvious thing to do, wasn't it? I think it was. I mean, I tried, I used to try and say, can we get over to see you? Well, Joe Hurley, he has his sound desk. I would say, well, can I, can I get over to you, Joe? He said, yeah, okay, boy, but uh, just don't be standing on my knobs. <laughs> and... Uh, but we got up close to him. It's just a great feeling of just going out. But again, remember that proximity. It's really, it's, it's about a level of intimacy and a level of connection more than it is anything else. I do remember also, funnily enough, being at a Simple Minds show, New Gold Dreams, an amazing album, mm. almost the beginning of rave, very tr- sort of trance-like music. And I remember walking to the back of a big festival site somewhere in Belgium, somewhere like that. Every single person was connected to them. Every single person. The sound was perfect. See, in places like your, like the RDS, when the sound isn't perfect, I mean, maybe they fixed it now, but we played a shite gig there too. On the album Songs of Innocence, the band seemed to be looking back, remembering the early days of the band and turning back into your original influences. Uh, can we expect something similar on the tour, perhaps more paired back this tour? Or what way is it going to be? Um, yes. And yes. And yes. And no. Three yeses and a no. Again, looking for that intimacy. But at the same time, we just can't help trying to do something that no one's ever done before. So we'll start with that real intimacy. We have a plan uh, that we're very, very excited about, and which is the most minimal moments we've ever done, the most stripped down, raw moments we've ever done. But we also have other plans up our sleeve to really mind mess I'll use, I'll use that word uh the you know to divide our audience in two and to to cause some mayhem it, it, this tour it's indoor isn't it mm-hmm. and it's vancouver yeah uh come on tell us what i can't let you too much what's what's, but, it, what's it going to be like well you know you two's always about being about some sort of commonality and you know, there's a unity of purpose at the end of a U2 show that's amazing. Um, Bob Hilburn, the esteemed critic, music critic from the Los Angeles Times, he said a great thing about the Rolling Stones once. He said a really extraordinary thing about the Rolling Stones is that they really have a gift for making you feel good about yourself. And he said, that's not, that's a, that's a very special gift. He said, U2 make you feel good about the person standing next to you. And I think that's true. I think there's a very special thing goes off at a U2 show.
we'll go for that. But we're also going to go for the opposite. We're also going to divide people. We think we're a divisive band. In fact, we know we're a divisive yeah. band. Uh, and all our favorite artists are divisive. If everybody likes you and everybody thinks you're great, you're probably, you're probably not great. And although the Beatles are an exception, um, <laughs> but then again, they're dead um, <laughs> as a band. It's um, it's a <clears throat> monumental task putting together that live the live show, the stage shows, and the ideas. Um, how long does it take to do that? I mean, and are you quite involved in that? I am. It's 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 the thing that I I do. Like when we wanted to play three hundred and sixty degrees outside. <laughs> That's impossible, right? Because where do you hang the speakers from? You can play 360 in Madison Square Gardens because you can just hang the gear. But they thought, they wanted to take me away. Hey, hey, <laughs> the men in the white coats. When I said, no, we're going to do it outdoors. They said, but you can't do it outdoors. That's impossible. I said, but even the Beatles used to play. They said, Bono, there was four speakers. No one could hear a thing. With our PA, you go tell Joe Early you want to do that. But that be, you know, you can meet Harry Carey. So... I drew it with, well, actually, I got, I got um, forks on the table and said, we just, we can do it. We can try it with cranes. We can try it. We can try and create this uh, apparatus that we can hang the speakers from. And that's, that'll be a, something like LAX airport, something like, you know, I had, I had a few examples. And Willie Williams, who's our show designer and creator, and, you know, just, he's my mate. We're like, songwriters in that sense um he 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 always goes he loves a ch challenge and then we took it to the production team and we we went on a walk over the field and said how big would the structure have to be to hang our pa from it and uh yeah. well he's like well um mm, very <laughs> like very and and it was and that created the so-called claw or the space station which which was amazing and or i will come up with you know zoo tv we, we you know we wanted to we, at this point with the amount of video stuff people, bands were taking on the road we said we might as well finish it off and just become a television station so zoo tv became that idea and we'd broadcast from the shows to anyone we want so on zoo tv we would we decided we'd broadcast to sarajevo just to one place and just remind the people under siege that we think about them and that we care about them, that we're Europeans too. So we, you know, all those kinds of ideas. Mm. Um, Very innovative. They, they, they come from a, a creative team that includes the band, um, that includes Willie and, and me. It also includes Gavin Friday. Gavin Friday is a huge influence on U2's uh, life. It has been going back to the Joshua Tree. People mm. don't know this. As well as saving with or without you from the, the the waste bin, which he did, which I'll always own for, because we were throwing that song out. Um, but he's really gifted at live performance, and Zoo TV was really great at Pop Mart. He was really great at. But it's a it's a it's a big team um, that 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 does it. Um, but often the maddest ideas uh, come from the person you're interviewing now, because that's what gets me <laughs> up in the morning. Is doing mad shit. Well, listen, tell me this then: of, of those three tours you mentioned, and all the other tours, what's been the standout tour for you? The one you've loved the most? Uh, the one I'm most proud of aesthetically, I think, is Pop Mart. Um, I just got it. I walked in when somebody was transferring, and I saw some of it, and it's 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 my block. I cannot get over this Klaus Oldenburg outsized sculptures, giant toothpicks and the mirror ball lemon. And the, I mean, it was just really amazing. And we got these great artists to collaborate with. It's like Roy Lichtenstein. Think about that. One of the great artists of the 20th century, the, one of the fathers of pop art. And he gave us one of his famous paintings and said, OK, you can, you can uh, animate it. to all the stages uh, I mean the lemon where is that and uh, the claw or, Paul McGuinness was trying to sell the lemon for years he, he was hawking it around Sotheby's 
and whatever. And he's, he, he kept coming, yes, we have a bar for the lemon. And then the same with the claw. This has been going around. This. In the end, people wake up out of whatever drugs he slipped into their drink. They're like, what are we going to do with this? What I would actually like to do, my dream, and it's not my dream, it's the band's dream, would be to have a site in Dublin mm. where we could show these stages and people could walk on them and walk around them. And I mean, I, at some point, I would love to do that yeah. if anyone was interested. But I think they're just interesting sculpturally as objects. And, you know, going like Zoo TV, all those Trabants, those little East German cars that we got painted by. I mean, they're, they're priceless at this point, you know, because they were famous painters of graffiti artists or whatever. And, uh, and that would be great to see them. Uh, do you still have them in storage? Somewhere. Yeah, great. Um, great. I know that I've heard the story of the Rolling Stone stages. They just they find big patches of land, send diggers and just bury them because it's, <laughs> because it's cheaper than storage. But I have a feeling we're stupid enough to store stuff. Uh, looking back through the years at the different tours, it seems to be a dangerous time for you. You uh, dislocate your arm on the Joshua Tree tour, voice trouble on Love Town, back surgery after injuring yourself, preparing for 360, and now your elbow. Uh, are the rest of the band keeping an eye on you? <laughs> uh, I mean, the only person who's as injured as me is Larry, because playing the drums is a really physical thing, and he doesn't just play the drums. He's, he's, he's a... He's in a he's in a physical relationship with them akin to violence, and that I think can take it out of you. So I, I feel I've gotten away lightly um, compared to him. He just he doesn't complain as much as I do. It's not as visible. Um, I've gotten away with murder. I mean, I've done really stupid, stupid things. In fact, I jumped off a balcony in Los Angeles. The same critic who went on to write so many beautiful things about our bands, said it was one of the stupidest things you'd ever seen. I also, on another occasion, went into a, an, an audience with a white flag. You know, I was making, I was, I was on this thing, I was anti-flags for a while. And I was thinking, you know, we don't need any national flags because the flag had turned our country upside down. I was sick of flags. So it's just the only flag is the white flag. And I was a student of nonviolence at the time. And I went into the crowd with the white flag and some geezer was pulling me you know by the balls or somebody was wrapped around my leg I turned around and smacked him <laughs> like there I am with a white flag this is not good this is not good and uh, the, Mr. Mr. Nonviolence is biting you know the hand of his audience <laughs> so I do have to watch myself because I get really wound up I, I want to at some point write about the psychology of being a performer in front of 20,000 mm. or 100,000 people because there's very little scholarship written about it and it's quite a it's quite a thing to be in the eye of that storm and you know people think oh gosh it must really explode your ego and and I guess it must in a certain sense but what they don't realize is it also crushes it. And I can't quite explain that to you, um, but I'm going to try. Um, or, or, and, and if I fail in, in the next few moments, I'm, I'm, at some point I'm going to try and write about it because the great performers are never cool because um, coolness and self being self-possessed and really it relates to being to not being, to not having, uh, or, to not, or, or to not revealing your deepest needs and desires. Performers, if they're any good, generally need the audience more than the audience needs them. And so that reveals your insecurity. So you're trying to fill it up, you know. I used to say, take, to take 20,000 people screaming, I love you, and I to feel normal is not really, <laughs> it's not really any recommendation. People say, well, what is it? You know, there's just a sea of faces. And I say, no, it's not a sea of faces. And I say, can you see different people out there? And I say, no, you see one person out there. They become one face. 
And that face can change. That face can be the reason why you're doing things, your father, you know, the absence, the mother, it can be your lover. That's ne- but it's, for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's not just a sea of faces. And now also, you know, to quote Mick Jagger, you know, there are moments when you're thinking about uh, the most mundane things will cross your mind. You know, uh, he says like doing the laundry. I doubt he does his laundry. But, um, but you know, there are other things that can take you away. But in the moments where, you know, that magic, that alchemy, where suddenly it's not a football stadium, suddenly time and space disappear and you're completely one with the song and you're completely one with the band and the band are completely one with the audience. That happens. And, and it happens with our band more than, 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 than you'd, you should expect. But it really does. And that becomes kind of your, your drug of choice and your audience's drug of choice. That's, that's the miracle. And then these, these concrete sarcophaguses are parked on the outside of some city, industrial wasteland, suddenly become just, you know, a kind of, what's the word of that um, magic? Xanadu or something. Like right. How, how do you... I can't you, believe I just said the word Xanadu. <laughs> I, don't, I don't normally throw around Xanadus. You're that's talking about effect. all that those emotions. The, that's, that's, yeah. that's the painkillers. <laughs> yeah. So here, no, try one of these. Uh, <laughs> you take one of them, yeah. But you know all those emotions when you're when you're playing live, just like you described there. How do you, when you when the show finishes, how do you come down after all of that? There must be incredible high out there. How do you? Does it take a long time to come down? Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it uh, it can, especially if it hasn't gone well. And how? What do you do to kind of come down? Well, I have, I've, you know, there's been a few. Th- I have <clears throat> it's only I have rage issues and <laughs> you know I have you know I'm like anger management you know I get so wound up and I'm, I'm, I'm a danger to myself and others sometimes I have to just go in a corner and just kind of calm down take oxygen or whatever it is there was a beautiful girl who used to do wardrobe she whacked me with a um, with a hairdryer one night. <laughs> and I was just I was just sitting down. I was getting ready to go back out on stage, and she's like blowing the hair. And I said, "I'm like yeah. I'm like a wild animal." <laughs> and and she just smacked me with the with the like, and I couldn't believe somebody would hit me with a hairdryer. <laughs> I knew I deserved it. <laughs> But I just stopped it right there. I just said, okay, well, yeah, you're right. And she's like, mm, just totally quiet. <laughs> Nassim was her name. Amazing girl. But no, I, I, I mean, I think I've seen Edge get wound up too about sounds and things and he keep it with him. I mean, but mostly it's joy. And I'll tell you, this is a really, this is confessions of a road rat and I'm really <laughs> embarrassed to say this. I prefer, as a hotel, kind of, I would prefer, say, the Clarence to the Four Seasons, just in general, right? I just think it's kind of cooler, it's more boutique, blah, blah, blah. Four Seasons is a big brand, and, you know, they look the same wherever you are in the world, you know. I found myself gravitating towards the Four Seasons in Balls Bridge here. And I said, drop by the Four Seasons for a drink, right? (laughs) <laughs> I'm sitting there. Going, what am I doing here? I was like, Clarence is there, and such and such is there. Like, and I realized because I've had some of the best nights of my life in Four Seasons because the band would always be staying in the Four Seasons because you do a deal with the hotel chain. So you come back from the show, blah, blah blah blah, go to your rooms, and you come downstairs. You're with your 
people, you're with your crew, you're with your tribe, you have, you know, incredible times. And they are, it's like Pavlov's dog. So I go into the bar in any four seasons somewhere. I'm kind of, I'm feeling it again. That's, a, that's an embarrassing confession. Um, and they look after me very well, I'd like to say, uh, here in <laughs> Dublin. Um, do you purposely push the boat out on every tour? Is there an element of making, making sure that you guys have the biggest and the most innovative show on the road? You, like you don't want to, any other band upstaging, upstaging you? I mean, again, most innovative, yes, we like to say mm. that. A very, I mean, there are moments when, I mean, I saw uh, Roger Waters the wall the other way. It was mind blowing. That made a real impression. Sometimes it's smaller ones like Laurie Anderson. You know, she did incredible live performance. It was a performance artist. It's not about the size. It's really, it's not about size. <laughs> <laughs> you know, size is, isn't everything. Um, but it is about the smarts, the innovation. The, uh, the last time you spoke to astronauts on the, in the space station. So, Bono, how are you going to top that? That was bonkers. that was brilliant, wasn't it? What was that? I mean, that's mad. That is, the, what are the odds? Uh, we did this moment on the last tour where we were contacting the International Space Station with this idea of, could you put some of our lyrics from, from Beautiful Day, the song Beautiful Day, the middle eight um, of that song, the little tangent in the middle of the song, is all what the things that you can see from space. As the things that you can see while you're orbiting the earth and you know the wall of china even got tuna fleets into a pop song which is uh, you know <laughs> something to be proud of see the tuna fleets and see you know see the oil fires you know all, i have all that so we said wouldn't it be great if we could put them up in you know get, get somebody from the space station to connect with us so this guy mark kelly said he would do that at the same time his wife was a uh, congresswoman, a very young liberal congresswoman. She gets shot. Gabby Giffords is her name. And she's shot by some right wing lunatic. And so we're now, on, we've Mark Kelly, he's in Space Station. He's part of Beautiful Day in the show, in the 360 show. And we've been using David Bowie's Space Oddity as a theme to walk on to. And we ask him, you know, to, 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 to communicate the, the, uh, these lyrics. And at the end of this communication, he just leans forward and he goes, tell my wife I love her very much. She knows. Quoting Space Oddity from David Bowie in the middle of our song, which is, there's so many spheres within spheres there. And... You know, and the shiver would go through it, particularly an American audience, because they've got such problems with guns and the availability of guns. And it was a really hot button subject. And as the tour was traveling every night, you'd see the husband of this woman who's, you know, still who survived the shooting, but is, was fighting for her life and can't speak still. And she's some difficulties, but it was that, that, was, that was a reason to exist. I remember that in Dublin. I went to all three of your 360 shows and that was a big moment. Mm. Yeah, big moment. We just talked a little while ago about um, you said that you, you know, live is where you live or die. You've had so many amazing live shows, but I, I imagine there must have been times when you were worried. Is it true back in the Zoo TV tour that, you know, that, that tour cost, um, I think it was a million dollars a week to put on. That it nearly uh, a million dollars it, a show probably. Oh, really? Did it nearly bankrupt the a band? A quarter of a million a show, yeah, a million dollars a week. That's right. It did nearly bankrupt the band, and those were the days when we couldn't get anyone to underwrite the tour, so it was very real. But we were very irresponsible in those days about things like that, and the, I remember people calling our 
you know, accountants and lawyers and agents would sit us down and say, if 10% less people come to the show, you are bankrupt. You do understand that. And we were, it seemed to almost just make us more excited. I wouldn't be like that now. We're, it's very easy to be cavalier about money if you have it. And, you're, you know, we're in our you know, late 20s, what was it, early 30s. And we're like, you don't think about things like that. But actually, it's quite serious because if people go bankrupt, a lot of bands have broken up for the reasons of, you know, their bad deals and it causes stresses and strains and lawyers get in. And in you 2 we've, we've tried to be smart about our business because in the end, if you're not, it can completely undermine the art. And Paul McGinnis kind of, instill that in us but he completely failed on Zoo TV he was exasperated what keeps you two together uh, unfinished business do you have any fears as a band yeah what are they that we give in to our fears because you two's really good when we're out there annoying people and, and turning you know getting in people's faces writing songs about subjects that other people don't and getting into trouble for being mocked, being laughed at. You know, I remember, um, who was it? He's a genius, Pat McCabe. I love him so much. Mm-hmm. One of our, he's like Joyce to me and he's living with us. I remember him saying to me, he said, you know, he said, he used to come to the country, we always would come up to see you too. And he said, you know, we'd, we, you know you'd be on a bill with some other bands and we, you know, you were writing songs about God instead of girls, and you were writing songs about things that we didn't. That were just so uncool and unrock and roll, and we wouldn't be liking you, and we'd be just listening, and then suddenly we'd be in tears, <laughs> <laughs> and we don't know why, <laughs> and we love you, and and it's like we're fighting, you know. I said, and you, you, so I think the band, our job is to do that, and if we, but if we stop, our fear is, is that. We get punch drunk. And I have occasionally had a band member late at night just say, I can't take it anymore. Like, it's just, you know, can we just just stop for a minute? Just, you know, just, you know, putting our head over the parapet. It'd be nice to be an indie band and just kind of hide behind the parapet and people don't really know what your songs are about. I don't think you could do that. Good tunes, they're cool, good groove, nice guitar part, looks mm. good, band look good, great, on the festival bill, no problem. There's a coward <laughs> in here somewhere who sometimes thinks that would be nice. Would it be nice to be cool, you know? Yeah, maybe, you know? And that's, that's the danger. You two trying to be cool, that would be, now that would be a disaster. We grew up in the same area of Dublin. Uh, I want to ask you about that. You and Where S- did you? Willow Park Grove. Oh, you could well. There's only about 500 yards down the road I yeah, think, from yeah, you. Yeah. And uh, sure, I used to see, I used to get the walk from there to get to 19A into town. And I used to see you the other side of the street with the, with the mullet, the long black coat, long black jeans, the boots. And I used to go, I don't know who he is, but he's cool, right? <laughs> and he looks good. How uh, old are you? I'm 53. So we're exactly the same age. Yeah. You're from Willow Park Grove. Those yeah. Willow Park Grove people are not to be trusted. <laughs> they are dangerous. So do we let, Ali, we've let, <laughs> we've let the Grove in here. Um, so is it a place you often return to and pop into the autopan for a pint or something like that? Do you, do you kind of venture over there? No, um, we, d- we haven't. And we brought our Southside kids across there recently. I'm, I did walk up Cedarwood Road. I really enjoyed it. Gavin's mother's still up there. And Googie's family are not. The Renixes, Stephen Renix, a great composer. Um, he lived there. He was a cousin of, of uh, Googie's. Uh, a lot of interesting people lived on Cedarwood Road. Um, number one, the Murphys had a great friend um, there, Pod Murphy. Anyway, the, the kids went back just recently for a Christmas present. They, they, they did a f- pretend album cover in front of Cedarwood Road. And whilst they were shooting the shot, um, <laughs> Mrs. Ryan, who owns number 10 Cedarwood Road, photobombed them. And she had no idea they had any connection to the house. And eventually she, they came in and uh, she, 
she brought them in. It was really sweet. And she showed them around. There's your dad's uh, bedroom. And, you know, there's the, the bathroom where he used to take a poo. And, you know, they, <laughs> they have photos of all this. It's fantastic. <laughs> and then, you know, in his bedroom, you know, there's under the, uh, under the floorboards, uh, he had a secret compartment. <laughs> I went, that's true. <laughs> and, and, and then they went, and the kids went, what was it? Did you know what was in there? Have you ever opened it? And they said, no, we didn't think that was right. So there's a secret compartment in the box room in Ten Seedwood Road. And I'm trying to think, what would I <laughs> put down there? And, and it's still there. And I completely forgot about it. Right. And um, so, you know, this, the, the community is beautiful community mm. and great, great, great people. But in the 70s, you might remember this, yeah. the, out the back of Willow Park, as, I think it was out the back of Willow Park, as well as Cedarwood, we had fields. That's right, out to the flats. And the fields, we used to play in the fields. And then they had a brilliant idea in Ireland. They said, when, when they just figured out that high rises didn't work anywhere, <laughs> they said, we'll have them in Ireland. So they took, broke up communities and brought people who would, part of communities and stack them on top of each other in the Ballymore Flats. And some people really liked it and some people really didn't. And the ones who really didn't, we used to meet in the fields and they'd kick the shite out of us. And, and then we, we, I mean, you know, so it, it, it was, the, that was the easiest part of, 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 of growing up in a way because you knew where that was. But, there are other memories of growing up which are there were vi- there was violence mm. and and a lot of it and it wasn't uh, necessarily gangs coming out of Ballymun or Finglas or indeed our own gang it would be behind closed doors domestic violence that's the horrible stuff mm. friends of ours being beaten with shovels by their dad and Mm. and starved and shit, mad shit. And it's the nicest street in the world. Yeah. And then you realize, this is normal. You know what's weird? Normal. Mm. Normal is weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I went to Mount Temple, I met, met people who were from backgrounds that I would never have normally, you know, posh kids and this, that, and the other. It was weird there, too. Mm. And so, I don't know if you're... What was your experience like growing up? I, I had a lot of fun there uh, because I, I grew up in uh, Finglas until I was about 14. Mm-hmm. And when my parents moved to Willow Park Grove, bigger house, mm-hmm. great back garden, front garden, lovely neighbours great street to grow up on lots of trees and and I did you have the little park in front of you yeah, uh, that was just about 100 yards down to the left yeah that was really nice yeah and went to Benevin College 100 you know a couple of hundred yeah, yards yeah. up the road and uh, Collies yeah and uh, had lots of friends there played soccer on, on the in the parks and uh, it was outdoors playing but before that up until I was 14 we just stayed indoors and played out the back garden and things. It just wasn't a great place to grow up. Right. Uh, but a lot of happiness in Willow Park Grove. Uh, yeah. Brilliant happiness there. And great, you know, really, really great people. And you, you're you probably the kind of person who knew how to stay out of trouble. Yeah. Which is why yeah, we you like see, you, Tony. You see, if you see the, see the, the gangs across the street, you'd... You knew how to. You knew to handle it. So get across yeah. the other side of the street. You didn't hang out with Gavin Friday, <laughs> who was wearing a wearing a dress. I used to and see him. Like that, boots, yeah, yeah, and had his hair like up in a kind of twelve inch mohawk, and you know who, which of course would draw fire. So we'd be. I'd say, Gav, do you have to wear the things like this? <laughs> we're walking down to Finglas, and we're walking, yeah. and you know the town, old town of Finglas. I'm. This is who I am. Oh God, this is going to be great. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, my my admiration for him is incredible because he wouldn't compromise on anything, and the um, the, the amount of hidings he got 
Wow. It was astonishing. And myself and Googie, of course, he wouldn't engage in, because he wasn't into violence, because myself and Googie were sort of into it. So we would end up in terrible situations there. So I have, and this is a very interesting thing, because you're 500 yards around, from, from really from me. My experience of growing up is so different from yours. And it's really about, I wrote in the song, I said, uh, it was a war zone in, in my head. In my head. It's a beautiful street. Yeah. And the cherry blossom tree yeah. was outside Googie's house. And it's gone now, by the way. I'd never seen anything as luxurious in my life as that tree. I just thought, wow, what is it doing there? And it woke up something inside me, that tree. And that park, the park that used to you sit on the wall there yeah. and, and kick football. You know, yeah. kick football. I mean... It was a beautiful thing, mm. a beautiful area to grow up in. But what was going on inside of our heads, Googie, myself and Gavin, it wasn't necessarily so beautiful. Is it easier for you to do your own thing in America? I imagine people kind of leave you alone around there. I know you can get lost in New York and it's a great mm. city, isn't it? I love the smell of that city and the noise of it. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I love New York. We've spent a lot of time there. Um, and when the girls moved over to college, um, suddenly this place, this house that you're in now, it hadn't been done up in 20 years and looked fine as it was. And Ali was going, you know, we need to give this place a little bit of a lick of paint and maybe we need to do, do, it, do it up a bit. Mm. And then we agree and we eventually figure out how to do it up. And then it goes, oh, it'll take nine months to, to do it up. Shall we go to New York? And I realize she's chasing her girls. You know, she wants to be with them. She doesn't want to be separate from them. So we lived in New York for a while. And it was pretty special. And the boys were there and they went to some school. Now, to get into a school in New York, it's like interviewing for university for like a 10-year-old. And one of these ridiculous, you know, primary schools, they're asking... They have to ask these questions. So, what is your philosophy as a family? And uh, Ali's like, what? What is your philosophy as a family? Asks the headmistress. And she says, well, like, I don't know, to be a family? And John, tell me, John, what makes you special? These are very philosophically unsound questions, especially if you ask an Irish people. And John, John is a comedian. He just gets it, gets it. Immediately he says, oh yeah, he says, I'll show you. He says, I can jump up and down on one leg with my hand on my head. <laughs> Taking the piss. And so the boys decided that New York wasn't for them. And we came home because they missed Ireland and they missed the things that we took for granted about mm. Ireland. And... They are the honesty of people. I mean, Americans are very honest uh, and upfront, but there's a there's a brutal honesty in here in Dublin that I think is good for the kids and is good for me. I mean, I'm, I joined a band because I like an argument. I'm in a really strong relationship because I need an argument. And I live in Dublin. Must be because I need an argument. And because there's one following me down the street or if I dare to open the newspaper there'll be another one <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to your, to your house today this must be a great place to get inspired to write with such beautiful views out there do you, do you uh, write much at home or do you prefer to completely switch off? So I don't you know writing for me is, is I don't have any choice over it mm. you know, I wake up with a melody in my head and I have to I have to write something down because it it puts me at ease, puts my spirit at ease. And um, so I've no choice, really. I mean, some people say, you know, you heard this expression, you can't sing to save your life. Yes. I sing to save my life because I think I have, I think I'm more volatile um, than than is good for you. And I think I write to sort of, to, to sort of douse the flames in a way. So, the new tour kicking off. 
I'm sure you're looking forward to coming back home to play again, are you? We can't fit this tour in three arena, the one that we're doing in Madison Square Gardens, and we're really bummed out about that. Why is that? It's, um, it's just the, the design of it. It's not quite the arena scale that we need, the Madison Square Gardens shape. Um, so we decided, let's do something then that we're not going to do anywhere else in the world. Let's, let's create the most intimate show we've ever done. Let's focus, let's do things we've never, you know, try everything else out. Yeah. So much to look forward to. Mm, no, um, that's, that's great. Thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting us to your wonderful home and, uh, and, uh, and chatting. So honestly, appreciate it. Well, we're, you know, big fans of you. And, and it, over the years, your um, just, you've been a kind of a light and and we've needed it. We've, you know, yourself, Jerry Ryan, people around who who occasionally will say, get off their backs just for a minute. Just like, uh, we really appreciate that. And I'm sure we've embarrassed you and I'm sure we've put you in some difficult corners. Um, but you've always st- stood by our band and it has meant a great deal to us that you've been on the radio playing our tunes for a long time now. And uh, so you are, you are, um, you know, you're you're more consistent than you two, uh, as far as Irish people are concerned. You're you're there more, and we really appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure.